Okay, so should we start? Yes. Okay. Would you please start the program? Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from all over the world. I am Shang Tai. Uh, me, today I'm going to uh, co-host with Dr. Felice uh, Petralia for this uh, web seminar called International Endometriosis Webinar at Time of COVID-19. And today we will have uh, four distinguished guests to uh, give their special seminar lectures. And after the uh, speech. We will have uh, 20 minutes for a uh, round table discussion. And let me briefly introduce today's speaker. The first one will be me, Shang Tai, from National Changgong University at Taiwan. And the second one will be uh, Dr. Fries Petralia, who is from uh, Italy. And the third one will be uh, Dr. Uh, Mauricio. Uh, abroad from uh, Brazil. And the first one will be uh, Dr. Sangwei Go from Shanghai, China. And last but not the least is Dr. Uh, Fumi Nomi, Fuminori Tanikuchi from Totori University, Japan. So uh, Dr. Petralia, would you like to say something before we start? No, no, it's just a pleasure to, to have this audience. Uh, it's a brilliant faculty. I thank Dr. Alborzi for keeping us together. This uh, big group of uh, international faculty, which will be very attractive. And this is a good moment to start again to speak about science because we, we had uh, several months of uh, uh, crisis. So it's, start, it's good to start. I, I really like this opportunity to get together again and to speak about the endometriosis and uterine disorders. Thanks uh, Dr. Alborzi for organizing. Okay, uh, I just got the message from uh, Dr. Alice Popop. He said that uh, now online there has uh, more than 500 Russian speaking listeners to watch the webinar. Wow. Thank you, Alex. So, Without further ado, I think I would uh, like to start uh, today's uh, speech. Okay. The title of my talk is uh, assigned by Dr. Sai Albozi, and he gave me uh, this very difficult uh, lecture. It's called uh, Investigation the Possibility of Pathophysiological Relationships Between COVID-19 and Endometriosis as an Inflammatory Disease. And before I start to work on this topic, I searched the PubMed. There's only six papers talk about endometriosis and COVID-19. And most of them uh, just tell the patients, uh, be aware, but don't be panic. There's nothing science about these six papers. So I will start to uh, make a brief introduction about the pathophysiological process of COVID-19 uh, with the emphasis of information. The COVID-19 is caused by SARS-CoV-2 virus. In those uh, SARS-CoV-2 infected patients, about 80% of them are asymptomatic or result in mild diseases. The remaining 20% of patients are severely or critically ill. The difference is the so-called cytokine storm. The cytokine storm is that our body produces large amount of cytokines and chemokines. And this cytokine storm is most dangerous and potentially life-threatening even related to COVID-19 deaths. So what is cytokine, uh, cytokine storm? And 
about a month ago, there's a review article uh, in Cytokine that shows these uh, very nice pictures. This, this is the uh, background of the sandstorm. In your body, we have a lot of cytokines that produced by infected cells and immune cells that cause the uh, de damage of our body, especially the lung and the airway. This is a very nice picture calling the uh, cytokine storm. So why would the body produce cytokine storm? We have to start with the uh, system, how SARS-CoV-2 infect our cell. In the healthy people, we have this uh, renin angiotensin aldosterone system to maintain the uh, blood pressure of the body homeostasis. And the angiotensin two was converted by uh, the angio uh, angiotensin converting enzyme two to become the angiotensin one seven. And in health people, angiotensin two will bind to the two receptors. One is called AT1. An AT1 receptor is for inflammatory that will induce the inflammation response and also cause the cell death if this is in the uh, alveolar epithelial cell. At the same time, angiotensin II can also in, uh, bind to AT2 receptor. And in contrary, AT2 receptor is an anti-inflammatory response. The angiotensin II can also cause the release of aldosterone, and this aldosterone bind to uh, stimulate the expression of a receptor called MAS. This MAS receptor is uh, for angiotensin 1-7, and the binding of angiotensin 1-7 to MAS cause anti-apoptosis. So in healthy people, the angiotensin system primarily bind to AT2 receptor and produce uh, angiotensin 1-7 and cause the uh, anti-inflammation and protective effect. However, when SARS-CoV infected the epithelial cell, this SARS-CoV will bind to the ACE2 receptor. The binding of SARS-CoV to the ACE2 will activate the pro uh, protease called TES. And these proteases will creep the ACE2. So under this condition, angiotensin II cannot be converted, become angiotensin 1-7. So the whole homeostasis was broken and elevated angiotensin II primarily by two AT1 receptor that cause poor inflammation. At the same time, at the same time, the angiotensin II, although it also induced aldosterone, but this aldosterone cannot produce the mass receptor. So the angiotensin 1-7 among is still reduced. The receptor is reduced. So the anti-apoptosis, the protective effect is reduced. So under this SARS-CoV infection, the epithelial cell will experience the poor inflammation, vessel constriction, and even apoptosis of the cell. So that will produce a lot of amount of the uh, cytokines. And here you can see this is the structure of the uh, SARS-CoV. And we have to pay attention to the spike protein. This is the protein that binds to the uh, ACE receptor on the epithelial cell. The ACE2 receptor not only expressed in airway epithelial cell, it expressed it express in most every cell, including the uh, macrophage. So using the spike protein binding to the ACE2 receptor, the virus enter the epithelial cell. Normally, when the virus infected the cell, it will trigger the uh, interferon response by activate toroid receptor 3, 7, and f kappa B that can produce a lot of cytokines. And these cytokines are supposed to recruit more immune cell to the infected epithelial cell to destroy the cell and the virus. Also, the virus will activate a pathway that cause the production of interferon three and seven and cause a lot of interferon expression. And 
this interferon will bind to the interferon receptor and induce more interferon response. In this way, the infected cell will secrete interferon to the neighboring cell and protect the neighboring cell from infected by the virus. However, under unknown mechanism, this SARS-CoV-2 can shut down this whole protective effect by inhibiting uh, trap and also the mass and trap. So when the epithelial cell was infected by COVID and in the early stage, there's an anti-inflammation, which is not good for our cell because our body did not know the epithelial cell was infected and the, our immune cell cannot recruit to the epithelial cell to destroy the virus while the virus load is slow. But after later stage, when the effective epithelial cell die and disrupt, so a lot of virus secrete into the circulation. At this time, the macrophage will bind to, uh, will uh, find the SARS-CoV-2 and use the FC receptor to uh, engulf the virus and this will produce and initiate the whole cytokine uh, producing effect. But because at this time there are so many viruses and all the macrophages are activated, so a lot of in, uh, cytokines will be produced. This is why uh, our body will experience the so-called cytokine storm. Large amount of these pro-inflammatory cytokines, not only is uh, the cytokines that we usually know, there's also a lot of chemokines. And this all released at a later stage of SARS-CoV infection. And once the cytokine storm activate, because it's so uh, rigorous, so the body will start attacking all the cells that will uh, have this virus infection. And this will cause the uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome. That's why I have a hard to breathe. So with that, and that will cause the whole body hypoxia, and finally, it will lead to multi-organ failure, and the final result will be death of uh, the affected patient. So the cytokine storm is deadly uh, a process that causes the 20% uh, people who are very ill or they are uh, eventually uh, experience uh, the death of uh, because of this cytokine storm. So with that, and then I will briefly introduce the pathophysiological process of endometriosis. Uh, we can see some similar and some uh, different uh, process. In the endometriosis, according to Samson's retrograde menstruation, the shed endometrial tissue retrograde to the peritoneal cavity that will uh, induce an immune response recruit neutrophils or macrophages to uh, the peritoneal cavity, try to uh, remove all these uh, debris. This macrophage and the immune cell will produce a lot of IL-1 beta, TNF alpha, and uh, prostaglandin E2. And these the, uh, cytokines, actually, they will try to recruit more immune cell to the uh, peritoneal, so they can remove the uh, retrograde tissues. However, these cytokines can induce CAX2 expression by stimulating the uh, endometriotic trauma cells. And this CAX2 will cause the conversion of a rocketonic acid and produce uh, a large amount of postlagating E2. At the same time, this cytokine also work on macrophage to increase the expression of CAX2 and produce even more postagradin E2. And this postagradin E2 can stimulate stroma cell to express uh, steroidogenic enzymes such as star and aromatase. As a result, the cholesterol will be converted all the way to estradiol. This is why uh, we think that endometriotic cell has its ability to produce estradiol. And estradiol will induce the expression of peptide growth factors such as FGF9 that stimulate the proliferation of uh, endometriotic cells. In addition, PGE2 can directly stimulate uh, FGF9 expression to cause the proliferation. This is why 
the aromatase inhibitor fail to cure uh, endometriosis because PGE2 can bypass the aromatase and cause uh, an estradiol to stimulate the proliferation of endometriotic uh, cells. On the other hand, PGE2 can work on macrophage and inhibit the phagocytic ability by suppressing the activity of MMP9 and the scavenger receptor CD36 and, and annexing A2 expression. By shutting down these three key players, the PGE2 inhibit the phagocytosis or macrophage. PGE2 also induce a lot of angiogenic factors such as IL-8, CYR61, angiogenin, and VGF to cause uh, angiogenesis. So all the elevated PGE2 can promote endometriosis growth by uh, promoting sterogenesis and angiogenesis and also inhibit phagocytosis. So now we compare the uh, COVID-19 and endometriosis. The first thing in common is imbalance of neutral fears. Neutral fear uh, play an important role as the first line of innate defense uh, ability both in SARS-CoV-2 infection and endometriotic lesion induction. In mouse model, when we induce endometriotic lesion, the first lymphocyte cell arrive is neutral field. And also uh, in Dr. Uh, Osuga's lab, they deplete the neutral field. They can uh, reduce the formation of endometriosis. But on the other hand, when neutral field, they overactivate they are called uh, neutral field extracellular trap. And this is the uh, extracellular webs of chromatin, uh, microbicidal proteins, and oxygen enzymes created by neutral fields. And all these uh, extracellular, uh, neutral field extracellular traps, they cause uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome in COVID-19 patient. And also this uh, neutral field extracellular trap can promote the progression of endometriosis. The second thing in common is the impairment of innate immunity. In the SARS-CoV-2 infected macrophage, and this macrophage one is infected by the COVID, uh, the SARS-CoV-2, and the similar effect of the uh, immune silencing will uh, uh, happen. So this macrophage cannot produce cytokines. And with that, they were lost the uh, phagocytic ability. So the first line uh, in that uh, de defense mechanism is lost. So in endometriosis, we also see the reduction of the uh, phagocytosis in uh, macrophages isolated from uh, women with endometriosis as compared to the macrophage isolated from normal women. And this is because, as I just mentioned, the high dose of prostaglandin E2. As here we can see, the macrophage pre with PGE2, the phagocytic ability was inhibited. But when the EP2 uh, receptor antagonist was added, then the uh, phagocytosis resumes. So the impairment of the innate immunity is the second uh, common phenomena between COVID-19 and endometriosis. And the third thing we can see is that although they all uh, produce a high amount of uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, but there's a difference. The cytokine storm induced cell death and tissue damage in COVID-19, which is uh, unique in the uh, COVID-19. In endometriosis, although there are many uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines being produced, but the end result would be like a chronic inflammation cell proliferation, anti-apoptosis, angiogenesis, and impaired phagocytosis and increased cell adhesion. So overall, these pro-inflammatory mediators uh, facilitate the uh, proliferation and the uh, growth of endometriotic cell. Uh, it does not uh, induce uh, cell death. So if we see that the cytokine storm is so uh, severe for the COVID-19 patient that 
uh, maybe we can shut down the cytokine storm uh, to cure COVID-19. IL-6 was found uh, negatively associated with disease severity. And so there are several clinical trials using IL-6 receptor antagonist that uh, can show very uh, promising results to cure that uh, COVID-19 uh, patients. So this is the paper that published a couple of days ago in Nature that used the desamethasone. Uh, the dose used is a six, six milligram per day for 10 days. They were cut the test by about one third in patients who were on the ventilator. Even the patient with, without ventilator, but uh, the oxygen level is very low, they receive an oxygen therapy that will improve uh, by about 20%. So inhibiting the cytokine storm can uh, save lives for those uh, severely ill patients. However, there's no study showing that uh, how can we trigger proper immune response in the early stage of SARS-CoV-2 infection. So our immune system can eliminate the virus while the viral load is still very uh, limited. But if we can find uh, this kind of uh, uh, treatment or this kind of uh, reaction, then the uh, infection uh, severity will greatly reduce. So how about using immune modulating therapies for endometriosis? There are some uh, small molecules and antibody-based disease modifying uh, anti rheumatoid drugs, cytokines, mTOR inhibitors, nucleotide analog, and various other small molecules being used to treat endometriosis. Most of them are using cell culture and animal study. Although many of these agents have promising results in vitro and animal study, few of them have been tested in humans. For the agents that were tested in women with endometriosis associated pain, little uh, benefit has been seen in symptom control today. So using immune modulating therapy to cure endometriosis seems not so effective uh, so far. So the inflammation and the immune cells is like the uh, force. What is the force in Star Wars, the dark force. We also have the uh, light side of the force. If we can properly regulate the immune response, either by SARS-CoV-2 infection or by suppressing the inflammation in endometriosis, I think the future of dealing with these two kind of disease is promising. However, if we did not find a way to balance the force, then let the dark force take advantage, then that would be the disaster of uh, either the COVID-19 or the uh, life quality of women who will suffer from endometriosis. That's all my uh, talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Tsai. Uh, again, it's a, a great honor and pleasure for us to be here together. And uh, the, the next speaker uh, is going to be uh, Professor Felice Petralia, that is the, the president of CEUD and the chairman of the gynecology and obstetrics department in, in Florence, Italy. Is going to speak about endometriosis and inflammatory disease incidence of systemic comorbidities in Asian and European population. Thank, Thank you. Felipe. Thank you, Mauricio. I would like to share my, these are my slides. Okay. So uh, as mentioned now by um, Professor Sai, in the pathogenesis of endometriosis, we have a 
hormonal derangement, but also uh, an increased inflammation, which cause pain and infertility. What is the, uh, uh, the mechanism of action? He has shown many elegant slides, and we agree that there is an interaction between hormone, hyperestrogenism, and progesterone resistance, which activates uh, inflammatory pathway. You see here phospholipases, COX-2, prostaglandin, inflammation. So we have two common words between COVID-19 and endometriosis, which is inflammation. Now the problem of inflammation and endometriosis is completely different because in our patients, uh, the inflammation causes uh, menstruation-related pain. We know this menorrhea, this paronia, this urea, this ketia. These are the main symptoms of our patients. So completely different, no respiratory tract infection, no, no symptoms in the respiratory tract. We have uh, the gyne, the, the reproductive organs. Also, uh, the pain may become non-menstrual, like chronic pelvic pain, headache, migraine, gastric pain. So the inflammation goes up and up during time, independently from the localization. We may have a endometrioma, we may have a superficial peritoneal endometriosis, we may have deep infiltrated. So the phenotypes are different, at least three types, four types. We don't know how many, but the symptoms are the same. And these women, uh, during time, they develop also other comorbidities because, for example, adenomyosis is associated with endometriosis. There are several publications you see here from 9, 2014, 17, in which uh, these women with endometriosis have also adenomyosis. But these patients have also appendicitis, for example. So we discovered that there is an incidental diagnosis of superficial endometriosis, in some cases also uh, appendicitis. And some of these patients you see here start from menstrual pain, after three, four years become chronic pain, and after five or more years become a chronic fatigue, stress, and depression. So there is no storm like uh, in COVID-19, but there is a slow progression from uh, a pain which is related to menstruation, then becoming chronic, then becoming chronic and stressful. So you, hear, you see here, in eight years, 10 years, you may have more and more symptoms in those patients. This is very critical because these patients have an, a quality of life is very poor. They have a, a physical problem, emotional problem, social well-being is disturbed. So the quality of life of these patients, of endometriotic patients, is failing. This is really uh, progressive. Uh, these women start to have problems at house, at work, their sport activities, sleeping, social, childcare, even in sexual relationship, they have problems. So the chronic stress problem uh, is a long-term process. Women have, uh, we have patients uh, who have endometriosis for 10, 15 years with really many problems, they start to have a headache. You see here, this is a central effect of endometriosis, which goes from the uterine contraction to the brain uh, migraine. What are the mechanisms of action? You see here, the endometriosis causes pain, and pain causes stress. So this is one of the major long-term process in women with endometriosis. And when you have stress, you see here in women who have been, who have endometrioma or deep, or deep plus endometrioma and receive, you see here, a stress test, they have a very high stress uh, uh, score system because uh, more is the pain, more you have uh, perceived stress. So these women have a, uh, pain and the stress-related disorders. You see here, which are the, the pain, the acute inflammation, which may mimic also the COVID-19, I agree. With, but when you have a chronic, you have a systemic comorbidity because chronic stress is modifying the immune system. You see here, uh, chronic stress can cause depression, anxiety, sexual impairment, migraine, chronic fatigue, but also immune-related, like asthma, psoriasis, eczema, fibromyalgia, thyroid dysfunction, inflammatory bowel disease. So we, move, we start 
from ectopic endometrium in the pelvis, but slowly, progressively, we move to the entire body from the brain, depression, anxiety, sexual migraine, to the entire body, to the dermatologic muscle thyroid dysfunction. So it's a very difficult disease, very important disease, difficult to treat because you don't have to treat only the uterus or the ovary, but you have to treat the, the systemic disorders. And you see here, this is a Danish study in Denmark. Women with endometriosis have a high risk of inflammatory bowel disease. So you have a patient with endometriosis, but she has also bowel disorders. So ulcerative colitis, Crohn disease, which a lot of pain, which a lot of disturbance. You have endometriosis, but you may have also allergies. And thus you have a food allergy, high hay fever, sinus rhinitis, and you have a 4.28 positive story of allergy in women suffering endometriosis. And then you may have also autoimmune disorders, systemic lupus, fibromyalgia, chronic, sugar, rheumatoidis, and multiple sclerosis. This is why uh, many women, after 10 years of history of endometriosis and pain, they develop a, immune disturbances, autoimmune disease, and their life, the quality of life is really poor. So they, they have reproductive system, symptoms, but they have also systemic symptoms. This is really a long list of uh, uh, systemic symptoms, which may be very uh, uh, aggressive for women for the quality of life. So what we did, uh, and I like to present in this Asian Seoul uh, collaboration meeting with that uh, Dr. Alborzi organized, we did a study in collaboration between two, China and Italy. We studied 30, 371 patients uh, and we evaluated the endometriosis comorbidities and quality of life between these two Chinese populations. It's across sectional studies. You see the population is almost the same. These patients were interviewed and we asked how many comorbidities. You see here, uh, Italian women have more gynecological comorbidities than Chinese population. And they started before endometriosis in some of these patients. Uh, which are the comorbidities we studied? So, we had uh, adenomyosis, uterine fibroids, and polycystic ovary syndrome. You see here that particularly adenomyosis in Italian population is much higher than in the Chinese population. And at least in this group of patients, we studied. Then we evaluated uh, the uh, autoimmune disease. Uh, if they had uh, rheumatoid arthritis, pemphigus, multiple sclerosis, myasthenia, autoimmune thyroiditis, or psoriasis. And you see here, the Italian population had more than Chinese population, the autoimmune disease, and they started before. So sometimes uh, the autoimmune disease is a promotion, it's a, favor, it's a factor which is in, in favor of uh, endometriosis. So, and you see here the, the, the huge difference between we have these two populations. Then we interview with inflammatory disease, allergia, asthma, intestinal inflammatory irritable bowel syndrome. And you see here again, the Italian population had more inflammatory disorders, which started at the same time, almost the same time as endometriosis. One of the other interview was uh, obesity, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia. Is, uh, are these uh, diseases different between Italian and Chinese population? You see here, again, Italian women have more metabolic and endocrine disorders, the Chinese population, and finally, the mental health disorders, anxiety, depression, eating disorders, and panic disorders. We asked to these women if they were affected by those disorders, and you see here the Italian population, again, was constantly more affected by uh, mental health disorders, as well as autoimmune, inflammatory, and gynecological disorders. So, in all the investigation, in these studies at least, we show that this uh, is a very uh, critical situation. And in fact, when we interviewed for physical and mental score, you see here the quality of life of Italian population was much lower. This is the physical score, this is the mental score. You see here is much lower. And when it's lower, you have less quality of life. 
So to have more comorbidities, more inflammatory autoimmune disorders, mental disorders, is causing a lower physical and mental score system. So this is really a very critical situation for us who are gynecologists. We want to treat a gynecological disorder, but we have at the same time a complexity of drugs we have to use. That's why probably I agree with Professor Tsai, uh, the glucocorticoid may be a very fantastic drug also for our patients because with glucocorticoids, we treat everything, the pain as well as the autoimmune disorder as well as the inflammatory disorder. So it's something to think about for the future in our population. I wish to thank uh, Professor Lumiu Biawe Wang shooting in uh, Guangdong Provincial People Hospital in uh, Medical Science Guangdong, China, as well as uh, Yan Ting Vu and Professor F.M. Wang and Yu Xi Shen from the International Peace Maternity Hospital in Shanghai. As well as in Italy, we had uh, the team in Firenze, Silvia Vanucisi, Tomani Capezzolo, and Marcello Ceccaroni in Graz. So uh, this is, was a very nice collaboration between Asia and Europe. Uh, and I hope uh, we will. And you see the difference is really significant. So it's something to explore in the future why we have such a difference. And I'd like to invite you, all of you to next November, we have uh, the Seoul Online Week from the 3rd to 6th of November. So you are all invited to participate. And we hope uh, next year we, to have a live Congress uh, like in our tradition and stay together in, uh, in Stockholm. Thank you for the attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Uh, Fries uh, Petralia. So uh, can you close the screen sh sharing? Sure. Okay. Okay. At the bottom, yeah, on, on the top, can you see that stops saving, stop sharing? Now I see is your uh, text desktop. Okay, good. Thank you. The next speaker is Dr. Uh, Mauricio Abrao, who is uh, the head of endometriosis unit in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the uh, Teaching Hospital of the University of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, Dr. Abrao, please. Thank you so much again. It's a privilege to be here with you. And uh, one important topic for us to to approach mainly in this COVID era is to talk about the challenges in imaging appearance, biomarkers, and clinical presentation that require further examination. So uh, the, the, I have no, uh, this is, these are my disclosure. And uh, these are the learning objectives of this discussion here. But the main proposal of, uh, what we are going to, to approach here is for us to, to talk a little bit about the non-invasive diagnosis of the disease. But for this, we need to start with, uh, uh, we need to review the definition of the disease because we know that for many years, the, the criteria for us, the morphologic criteria for us to, to define endometriosis, first of all, would be to find glands. And, now, and then uh, many publications show it that the stroma is an important part of the disease. And uh, probably the, 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 the stroma is the source of the glands. And it's, it may be even more important than the glands when you talk about endometriosis. And more recently, uh, there are some publications, and this is a very nice one from Paolo Vigano and, and the Italian group, showing that this is time to redefine endometriosis, including its profibrotic nature. And that this is very important for us to diagnose the disease properly, and of course, to find a new way for us to stop the disease or even to treat properly the disease. So the key messages of this study is that 
endometrial fibrosis must receive more attention as a potential targets of medical treatments for endometriosis. Animal models should present fibrosis and the definition should include fibrosis uh, as part of the diagnostic implication. So when we talk about non-invasive diagnosis, we must consider this possibility for us to, to, to look for fibrosis. And the other important thing that it's important for us to mention is that when we, we talk about endometriosis, we may be talking about different diseases. And for us to, to diagnose it, this is very, very important because uh, in this study from 97, uh, uh, Michel Nizol and Jacques Donnet proposed that uh, probably we are talking about three different diseases and they considered the peritoneal, ovarian, and rectovaginal septum endometriosis. What we consider now not rectovaginal septum, but deep endometriosis. So this is very important for us to, to talk about before talking about the, the non-invasive diagnosis. And the last introductory uh, slide that I would like to mention here is that uh, when, when we think about the disease, even laparoscopy being uh, uh, the gold standard, standard pattern of the, diagnose, of the diagnosis of the disease, it has many, many limitations. If you see uh, situations like this, that is very common when we, 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 we do laparoscopy for endometriosis, uh, what should be the, the therapeutic approach for these cases? Because sometimes in this imaging in the right side, you can see that there is a complete blockage of the cul-de-sac and for sure, uh, without a pre-operative diagnosis, it's very difficult for us to plan the disease in different manners. So this is why this is a very good example for me that I would like to, to show you. When a patient came to me in a situation like this, and this is a, uh, she, she brought this uh, DVD from a surgery that she did uh, two months before the consultation, where uh, the, the surgeon uh, told her that he treated the disease in this manner. As you can see here, he made a, a very small biopsy from this foci of endometriosis. There is a, uh, an adhesion there that is very relevant. And uh, he coagulated the tip of the iceberg. So the patient came to me and uh, she had in the, in the clinical exam, she had the disease there, a nodule in the vagina. And as you can see here in the ultrasound, we can, it's very easy to see this hypoechoic lesion compromising the bowel. That for sure it was hidden by that uh, adhesion that we saw in the previous laparoscopy that the other surgeon did. So after this diagnosis, that is very relevant. It was possible for us to plan uh, a disease that was considered a recurrence, that for sure it was not a recurrence, was a persistence of the disease in a proper manner. So we, we indicated the surgery according to the algorithms that we, we do nowadays, but looking for opening. This is, is our laparoscopy where we open the pararectal spaces and we started to approach the disease uh, uh, knowing the anatomy from the lateral side and then realizing that there was a huge nodule there. You can see here that there is a disease compromising the vagina, the rectum. So this is uh, what we did considering the uh, preoperative pre diagnosis. So when we talk about this non-invasive diagnosis, the first step for us is to think about the clinical uh, diagnosis, the symptoms of the disease. As you can see here, we, can, we have six symptoms. Uh, we, we have dysmenorrhea, uh, chronic pelvic pain, infertility, dyskesia, dysuria, and dyspareunia. And we know, according to this publication that our group did in some years ago, that the deep disease may have may be much more symptomatic as you can see there. So uh, this is very important. Even, even in these times of uh, when uh, sometimes we need to have uh, 
telemedicine helping us to discuss with patients before she, they can come to the office. We need to hear them. We need to ask for this about the symptoms and to do this clinical diagnosis. About the markers, uh, for sure, uh, there are many, many studies being done all over the world trying to find a good marker for us to, to be helpful for us to, to diagnose the disease. Even in our group, uh, we published many years ago, almost 20 years ago, this study in the human reproduction showing that the CA125 would be helpful uh, if the, 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 the dosage could be done during the first, second, and third day of the menstrual cycle. But after this, what happened? No other strong markers came. We know that even our group published other studies looking for different markers, interleukines, uh, uh, pro markers of uh, inflammation like the uh, SAA, the, the amyloid A protein. But even like this, we, we, we don't have, we don't think that we have uh, until now a good marker for the diagnosis of disease. Hopefully with the proteomics and metabolomics in the future, we can have other ways to have a, a, a marker to be combined with a clinical exam and the imaging for the diagnosis of disease. And the, the, the very strong development that uh, happened in the last years was the the, the use of the imaging for the pre-op diagnosis of the disease. We know that traditionally uh, the ultrasound and the, even the MRI may be helpful for the diagnosis of the ovarian endometriosis and uh, mainly for cysts bigger than 1.5 centimeters. And uh, there are some questions that to be answered uh, by uh, the imager when we think about the endometriomas compromising the ovaries, uh, uh, that uh, if there are signs of malignancy, the size, the number of cysts, uh, other sites of the disease, and the ovarian reserve is very important for us to, to think about when we, we use imaging to diagnose the ovarian disease. But of course, uh, other methods can be used for the diagnosis of the ovarian endometrioma like MRI, and we know that MRI uh, in, in T2 uh, can be very helpful for us to diagnose the disease. But the big challenge in the last years was the diagnosis of the deep endometriosis. So this is how we started, right? We started looking for different methods uh, for the diagnosis of deep endometriosis. We started in 98 using the rectal endoscopic ultrasound. And at that time, we published it after a few years this is study showing that the rectal endoscopic ultrasound may be helpful, but the big problem is that uh, it's not uh, feasible to do a rectal endoscopic ultrasound for the, the big amount of people, uh, of women with endometriosis, because it's painful, it's more expensive, it depends on an endoscopy, and of course, uh, it only provides information about the, the rectum and not the other sides of deep disease. And this is why we, we, we started after uh, 2002, 2003, to work hard towards the, the imaging, uh, considering the MRI and the ultrasound. We know that MRI is a good method for, for us to use. They ha it has uh, interesting benefits for the diagnosis of the endometriosis because it's non-invasive, it's well tolerated by the patient. It has a good accuracy. It can provide a pelvic map and uh, allow us to, to, to see associated pathologies. But the problem is that it's more expensive. And if it's compared with other uh, methods like ultrasound, it may not be as good as ultrasound as I'm going to show you here. So this is when we decided to start working hard with a transvaginal ultrasound with a very simple bowel preparation. You can see here uh, a hypoechoic uh, lesion that can be seen by ultrasound. Uh, and uh, for sure, in the same uh, way that I showed you before in that uh, laparoscopy, this is another case that is very similar when the laparoscopy cannot see the, the deep disease, 
and the previous ultrasound and the previous combined with a good clinical exam can see and can drive the surgeon to, to, to do the treatment. So this is why we, we do nowadays, we, we published this study in 2007, showing that the, the sensitivity for the transvaginal ultrasound with a very simple bowel preparation that is a very simple enema one hour before the exam uh, for us to diagnose the endometriosis compromise in the rectum is of 98% versus 83% with the MRI. And when we think about the other sites of the disease, like the disease compromising, for example, the retrocervical region, the, the ultrasound is, is, has a, a better accuracy as well, as you can see here, 95% versus 76% with MRI. So this is uh, the, the, the first strong study that our team did and uh, followed by other studies like this showing that uh, in addition to the, the, the diagnosis of the deep endometriosis, we can use the ultrasound to, uh, to have more information like the number of lesions that compromises the rectum, the layers of the bowel that are compromised or even the circumference of the rectum uh, affected by the disease for us to plan properly the, the treatment. So this is what we see. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, the rectum and the, the hypercoagulation shows that 40% of the, the circumference uh, of the rectum is affected by endometriosis. And uh, we can, uh, of course, also define the distance between the lesion and the anal verge to predict the risks of the surgery and to plan properly to discuss with patients to have a good team uh, helping us in terms of the multidisciplinary approach, as you can see here. So you can see that it's not difficult for us to see the layers of the rectum compromised by the disease. And for this, we use a simple ultrasound with a simple bowel preparation, providing a map uh, for the diagnosis of the disease. So nowadays we are working in other uh, specific protocols. We have this study that we, we published recently uh, showing that we, we must have even a structured imaging report for ultrasound and MRI for the treatment planning of patients with endometriosis. And also more recently, we started diagnosing endometriosis, peritoneal disease, uh, not in this way that this study uh, showed uh, with the PET-CT, but using the same ultrasound and the, uh, the sensitivity is, in, is improving a lot. Yeah, nowadays with the new, new protocol and the, 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 we, we can diagnose lesions with more than one to two millimeters with ultrasound, uh, making us uh, consider the ultrasound and the clinical exam uh, feasible for us even to stage the disease before the surgery. So the rationale considering all of these uh, possibilities that I mentioned here is to start with a good clinical exam. The, we don't have the marker, a good marker yet, and to use a very nice ultrasound done by a specialist and this training process takes no more than one week for that it's what we did for many people from all over the world. We trained people, for example, we trained more than 20 radiologists from Australia, for example, and Australia is doing very well for the non-invasive diagnosis of the disease. And when this exam is normal, it seems that the patient doesn't have endometriosis or she has very small foci of the disease. So we can be more conservative in terms of the treatment of the disease. If it's conclusive in terms of finding endometriosis in different sites, we can indicate the treatment. And if we have questions about the ovary, MRI can be recommended. Questions about the rectum, we can do the transrectal ultrasound. It's very rare nowadays for us to indicate this exam. And questions about the urinary tract, urography or uro MRI can be performed. And for us to, to conclude, uh, there is other uh, things that we are thinking of nowadays. And one of them is to try to use this uh, information to create 
algorithms for us to treat the disease. So in this study, for example, we divide patients with endometriosis with pain, with infertility, and pain and infertility. And we consider the visual analogic scale criteria with more than seven or more less than seven in terms of the amount of pain to define if we are going to do the surgical treatment or uh, a medical treatment before uh, to be more conservative in situations like this. And for patients with infertility, we truly must add to this formula of the diagnosis of the disease a good evaluation of the ovarian reserve using, for example, the anti-Millerian hormone. And also, uh, according to this criteria, we start for this patient with infertility with a good imaging method combined with a good clinical evaluation and the evaluation of the ovarian reserve. If the pain is not relevant for these infertile patients, and uh, we can start uh, looking for the infertility uh, before uh, the, the treatment of the disease. But if, if she has two IVF failures, or if she has a very relevant pain or bowel obstruction or ureteral obstruction, we, according to the ovarian reserve or the age of the patient, we can suggest cryopreservation before surgery, or uh, if the ovarian reserve is normal, we can even uh, recommend surgery followed by uh, induction of the ovulation and trying to preserve uh, the, the, in the best uh, manner that we can the ovarian reserve and we are going trying to, to use laser uh, uh, for uh, the ovarian disease to try to be conservative. And my, my, the last study from our team that I would like to show you is this uh, exam that we, uh, we did trying to, to check to optimize the perioperative planning followed by surgery, for example, for bowel endometriosis. So if we consider that according to this algorithm that I showed you before, that for example, for endometriosis compromising the bowel, we can do shaving, discoid resection or segmental resection. What we did in this study is to evaluate uh, 172 patients in the last three years that were submitted to surgical treatment for endometriosis. Then the, the idea that is very relevant for this discussion here is to check the number of patients that we planned and that we changed our mind during the procedure to see the, the relevance of the, the imaging before the, the treatment of the disease. So as you can see here, we planned, for example, for 30 cases to do shaving. And the, we, we planned this quad resection in 71 cases and segmental resection in other 71 cases. And what happened was that for those patients uh, that we planned shaving, using the imaging before, we upstaged, we did more in only two cases, right? For those patients that we recommended this quad resection, we downstaged, we did less in 12 cases, and we upstaged in two cases. And for the segmental resection, we downstage it in nine cases, two for shaving and, and seven for discoid resection. But the, the message of this uh, study is that uh, for sure, uh, the, the, when we have a good imaging before, we plan, we do what we plan in 85% of the cases. In other 12% uh, of the cases, we downstage trying to be more conservative. So it's very relevant for us to use the pre-op diagnosis for uh, the, the, the treatment of uh, such an important disease. So thank you so much. And uh, let's move ahead for the next speaker. And, and thank you for this very kind invitation. Thank you, Dr. Abro. Our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Sangwei Go from the uh, Shanghai OVGY Hospital and the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, uh, Fudan University. Uh, Sangwei has been in uh, many uh, board members of the International Society, and especially he 
is the uh, past president for the Asian Society of Endometriosis and uh, Endomyosis. Today he's going to give a talk about a look into the future. What could be promising therapy approach? Sangwei, please. So you got to turn on your microphone. Okay. Um, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for your uh, nice uh, introduction. Uh, it's been uh, an honor to to, uh, to be invited to, for this uh, nice session. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, to talk about the uh, future promising uh, approaches. And let's see, let's get started. Uh, oops. <clears throat> There's nothing to dis uh, disclose. Um, essentially, I'm, when, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, give a, a current overview of the uh, emerging and current uh, treatment arsenals and what we know about phys uh, physiology of adenomyosis, essentially the, the natural history, and also there's an alarming innovation drought in drug and IMD for adenomyosis, and also emerging thermal ablation methods, pros and cons, and the Achilles heels and looking ahead. Now, as we know that the uh, adenomyosis is a very common disease, and it has a uh, usually clinical presentation includes an enlarged uterus, and uterine hyperostosis, and dysmenorrhea, heavy menstrual bleeding, or infertility. It's a, actually it's an under-researched area. As you can see that uh, if you search the Medline, and there's about uh, 26,000 papers, uh, more or less related to uh, endometriosis, but not adenomyosis. When you look at the uh, adenomyosis, actually there are not many papers. Uh, that's the, since the inception of the uh, MEDLINE. Uh, since, uh, I think since the, they include uh, papers published in the 1950s. Uh, when talking about a, a, such a common disease, there's only about 1,000 papers. So it's not actually uh, it's a very under-researched area. As you, you can see that the, uh, in terms of uh, num increasing number of publications in uh, endometriosis, but uh, comparatively speaking, the adenomyosis is not much. Uh, in terms of treatment goals, essentially there are three. Uh, the first one is to alleviate symptoms, either pain or abnormal uterine bleeding, and to preserve fertility, and usually that means to preserve the uterus. And in many women, that the, the uterus has been viewed as the uh, iconic uh, uh, symbol for womanhood. So even then, near, nearing the menopausal age, they do not want to remove it for uh, some reasons that are very understandable. So far, we have very limited arsenals to treat adenomyosis. Of course, that the surgical is one. Uh, hysterectomy is a, can be considered as a final solution. Uh, but as, just as I mentioned, many women are very reluctant, or uh, even uh, when deciding, uh, trying to decide to make the decision, it can be very traumatic, especially for women who have not had their own families. Uh, or you can use medical treatment, like a GNI, IH agonist, IUD, or, or a contraceptive, uh, but this suddenly there's no new drug seems to be on the horizon. Now, we, as we know that the, most of the uh, clinical trials has been uh, has to be registered in um, <clears throat> some uh, clinical trials um, and registry, for example, clinical trials like out. And we can see that so far there are 65 clinical trials uh, being registered uh, at that site and for phase one to phase three. But only um, about 18 of them actually is so actually testing some uh, procedures or drugs, and about 13 of them actually testing drugs. Mostly actually are, are testing traditional or hormonal drugs, for example, the uh, intrauterine uh, systems, aromatase inhibitor, ifepristone, and also one of them actually uh, unipristone, which is a selective progesterone receptor modulator. And there's one or two trials testing on uh, a DID2 agonist. Um, this is essentially a uh, drug containing vaginal ring. 
one, um, the only uh, the, the study sponsored by a drug company is the uh, oxytocin receptor inhibitor. But that trial is actually essentially a DOA, dead uh, on arrival, essentially, without launching it, it actually was um, withdrawn for some reason that um, we don't know. And there's another one that's actually tested the, uh, uh, the um, 5 -H 5HT3 antagonist that's actually, actually trying to reduce post-operative nausea and vomiting. And which means that in the next five to six or eight years, there will be no um, any new drugs for adenomyosis, which is a quite uh, dismal uh, outlook. Uh, in terms of pathogenesis overall, we don't know uh, little. Uh, we don't know much about it, and it's actually uh, likely to be multifactorial, and it's very complex. And the several uh, theories, stem cell uh, theories, and also uh, tissue injury and repair, and also um, and, and one I propose is the intermutual mild-mutual interface disruption, and we actually have a, a mouse model to prove it, which actually uh, <clears throat> should uh, allow people to uh, further uh, to, uh, unveil the pathogenesis of adenomyosis. So what about its uh, pathophysiology? Uh, it's actually, there's many papers, again, just like, uh, uh, like a situation that in which the blind man can try to figure out what the ele elephant looked like. So on our surface, uh, some papers uh, have some stories, but then uh, we still don't know the, the whole picture. And that's the problem. So what we did is actually, go, we went back to the very basic. And that's the, uh, and we used to take advantage of the defining hallmark of the ectopic intermediate, which is the cyclic bleeding. And, um, and once there's a cyclic bleeding and there's ind indicative there's vascular injury, which is actually is a quintessential hallmark of wound or tissue damage. So once there's a tissue damage, there's also a tissue repair that will ensue. So this is actually the evolutionary conserved mechanism. It happens to all uh, uh, organisms. And uh, so, <clears throat> and this is a feature that is shared both by endometriosis as well as uh, adenomyosis. Now for uh, tissue repair, we know, uh, a lot of them, uh, we know that it's a systematic process consisting of four overlapping phases. And there's a homostasis, inflammation, proliferation, and tissue remodeling. If any one of the phases, four phases goes wrong, and then will it lead to pathological condition, for example, also uh, non-repairing uh, non and also the all fibrosis. And when we, um, Examining the uh, endometriosis lesion, for example, that, that is a very nice paper published uh, over uh, <clears throat> 14 years ago that uh, looked at the um, rat model of endometriosis. They looked at the immune cell population. Unfortunately, they only examined uh, macrophage as well as the um, <clears throat> uh, neutrophil. And that's when you look at it, it looked exactly the same as the uh, wound repair, which means that the um, in wound repair, that once there's a tissue injury, the platelets are always goes in the first place, followed by uh, neutral fields, and then macrophages, and, fo and then followed by uh, lymphocytes. So uh, for adenomyosis, uh, we're now in terms of natural history, now we know pretty uh, a lot uh, about it, and we know that the platelets, macrophages, and other immune cells secrete factors that induce uh, progressive uh, epithelial mesenchymal transition, fibroblast, myofibroblast, transit differentiation, and actually, that uh, Mauricio actually mentioned about fibrosis, and that's a the one cell that is the myofibroblast is actually the most important effector cells that are responsible for fibrogenesis. There's also there is a smooth muscle metaplasia that um, in uh, adenomyosis explain why the uterus become larger and larger. 
and fibrosis as well. Um, and also this uh, reduced hormonal uh, receptor expression, for example, uh, progesterone receptor uh, isoform B expression, this actually goes down as the uh, lesion progresses. So essentially, this is the natural history of ectopic endometrium. It, it not only includes the endometriotic lesions, but also adenomyotic lesions as well. Essentially, the lesional microbial environment is very important. The platelets within and also the immune cells, neutrophils, uh, macrophages, NK cells, they all uh, <clears throat> they work together uh, to, to, first of all, they actually uh, crosstalk with the endometriotic lesions and also sensory nerves, as we find out uh, last year, that they also participate in this um, uh, uh, process in the, in the sense that they actually actively uh, communicate with adenomatic lesions. They actually have to push the, uh, the progression of the uh, lesion uh, development. In the end, you will see the enlarged uterus. You will see increased contractility. You will see increased hyperinnervation, increased fibrosis, and more pain as, long as, as well as the uh, epigenetic uh, changes. And that explains why adenal mouse is a very uh, difficult uh, for medical treatment. And as you can see, that is actually some of the work that we did uh, several years ago. We actually looked at the adenomatic lesions and we found out that the, using different methods, we find that the, there's a, the lesional, there's a lots of uh, um, collagens, especially the type one collagens. And that's actually makes the tissue very, very hard and nodular. So that's why that uh, Polar uh, in Milan is actually proposed to define endometriosis, including the, uh, the uh, prophyrobotic nature. Uh, <clears throat> and we can actually that, uh, uh, just uh, go a little bit beyond and propose that the adenomyosis is a condition that started with the deposition of endometrial stroma and epithelium within the myometrium, which undergoes cyclic bleeding and thus repeated tissue injury and repair, resulting in gradual and progressed smooth muscle metaplasia and fibrogenesis. And once there's a smooth muscle metaplasia, it explains why that the, the, the uterus become larger and larger, simply because the stromal cells actually become uh, smooth muscle cells. So we now have, a, uh, in, a, in terms of big picture, we know pretty much about it. Of course, there's still lots of details need to be worked out, and, and that will be for future uh, uh, research. And with this, we actually take uh, advantage of it, and we know because of the, uh, the overall progression is the, the uh, ultimate uh, fibrosis. So we use the ultrasonic uh, uh, technique, it's called ultrasonic elastography, which is actually akin to the um, the palpation, essentially try to measure the stiffness of tissues. And we, uh, in this case, we actually used uh, Hitachi. Uh, this is actually st uh, string-based uh, elastography to, uh, to measure the tissue stiffness. So we can actually, uh, you can, as you can see, that the leftmost is actually the, uh, the normal uterus. And the <coughs> elastography used the false color. Okay, the hardest one is the blue one, and the softer one, uh, softest, softest tissue will be red. So you can see the endometrium actually is very, uh, it's, it's very soft, and, and also uh, there's some kind of a, a something in between. And this is actually for uterine fibroids. The, the, the lesions are a little bit harder. But the hardest one is actually for adenomatic lesions. And as you can see, this is actually this uh, uh, normal tissues, normal myometrium, these fibroids, this is diffuse uh, adenomyosis and focal adenomyosis. And this is a very good example. This is a, a patient, a woman about 35 came in, came in. she complained about um, <clears throat> this menorrhea and her uterus, as, as you can see, is not very large. And the, um, the ultrasonist, uh, the person actually looked at it and couldn't see anything. And, but then uh, we use elastography and we can actually see small lesions. 
which is a bit uh, moderate uh, stiff. And then um, the physician actually gave her uh, JIH an antagonist, and she responded very nicely. So this actually shows that the elastography has some potential in diagnosing uh, adenomyosis. And recently, we had a paper published to show that the adeno, uh, ultra, ultrasound elastography can be uh, more powerful uh, to detect the deep endometriotic lesions than conventional ultrasound. So essentially, we can see that the, well, if you measure the, the lesional stiffness or tissue stiffness, we can see that the hardest the, uh, tissue will be the adenomyotic lesions, followed on average by the fibroids, which is also harder than on average and a normal uh, myometrium. And this is also true that the, the, and also the extent of lesional fibrosis and correlate very nicely. Uh, we have a correlation coefficient uh, of 0.9 uh, with the uh, lesional uh, uh, stiffness, which is very nice. Uh, this actually can ensure that the, what we measure the lesional stiffness actually is the uh, extent of lesional fibrosis. This is another study that actually, again, it shows us the uh, co nice correlation. The other thing is the uh, endometrial uh, progesterone receptor staining and, or expression actually uh, correlated negatively with the tissue stiffness in the sense that the, um, as the lesion becomes stiff, uh, stiffer and stiffer and the, um, Progesterone receptor expression is going to be goes down. And that explains why uh, for some uh, patients, they actually don't respond very well to uh, uh, hormonal treatment, simply because their uh, progesterone receptor expression is probably going to be uh, downregulated. <clears throat> and in addition, that the, we can also see that, um, and let's see if we have, have the data. Now, the other thing is that, I don't have the picture here. Another thing is that the tissue lesional stiffness correlated uh, negatively with the uh, vascularity in the lesions. In a sense, if the tissue has very stiff, it means it's highly fibrotic. It also means the number of uh, <clears throat> micro vessels actually is going to close down. In, in, a, in this sense, you, you will know immediately that this explains why uh, drug treatment is going to be very difficult, simply because if the lesion is highly fibrotic, the uh, drugs will not be able to be uh, delivered to these lesions, simply because uh, all, the, all drugs, whatever the delivery route, uh, eventually has to deliver to the lesional uh, target tissues. If the vascularity goes down, and there's no way you can actually deliver the, the drug to the uh, tissues. So uh, surgical, uh, this, uh, it's very invasive. Of course, there's also laparoscopy, minimal invasive, and it's, it's, it requires uh, uh, highly uh, skilled um, surgeons, and also some uh, non-surgical means. Of course, uh, medical is non-invasive, and also there's some uh, super, super microbe invasive, invasive approaches is uh, coming out uh, in recent five, six years. The other one is the, is the high intensity focused ultrasound is the uh, non-invasive one as well. And, and the one is the uh, radio frequency ablation. And that's actually exactly the same as the induction oven that, uh, in the household. Essentially high frequency electric current generates heat, which can be used to ablate tissues. Uh, <clears throat> that's actually, you can, uh, uh, deliver this heat uh, through several routes. One is the reposcopic or transabdominal or transcervical or percutaneous, and it can be guided by ultrasound. And um, it's, it's, uh, this is the, uh, the Sonata system, and it's approved by the FDA for treating uh, fibroids. And of course, people also kind of uh, use it to treat adenomyosis and there's some challenges and I'll be, I'll mention uh, in a minute. This is another system. And uh, there's also, there's uh, this is the system made by a Chinese company 
They use the trans uh, cervical probes. And also there's uh, two types of high intensity focus ultrasound hypo. And one is used, uh, using a magnetic re renaissance um, imaging guided hypo. And this, it gives the clear picture. And it gives a more precise delivery of ultrasound energy and it gives you a real time monitoring of local temperature. But it's far more expensive than the ultrasound guided the high uh, which is less expensive, give less clear pictures, and there's less precise delivery of ultrasound energy. So uh, this is the uh, high system. And, um, <clears throat> and this, is, this is another one. This is the uh, uh, this emerged in the last half six years. It's a microwave ablation system. And they use it for one or two antennas. And the upside is, is this uh, system is uh, it's not very expensive, actually. We're, uh, we're talking about um, maybe uh, 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 maybe $100,000 US dollars, or maybe less. So essentially, this is the uh, <clears throat> microwave, essentially, that generates the uh, heat through microwaves, and just like a microwave oven. And the, uh, through the antenna, they can deliver heat to the target tissues. And if the process actually be monitored by the ultrasound. And this is actually the, the, the picture that the people are doing it. And uh, essentially that the, um, uh, it, it, it coron uh, carbonizes the, uh, the target tissues and there's an ablation zone and the surrounding zone is actually a bit damaged, but, uh, but the still preserves some uh, structure. And there's normal tissues. And it's really kind of uh, minimal uh, invasive. There's actually the uh, insertion site. And so when you compare the three uh, different ablation methods um, in terms of invasiveness, hypo is, of course, is actually the um, uh, <coughs> essentially non invasive. Um, <clears throat> and radio frequency is also super minimal, uh, uh, microwave. Same thing, but the um, uh, cost is actually low. Um, and energy source, they use the one is used the high frequency radio wave, and this one uses the microwave. And uh, ultrasound, of course, uses the ultrasound. Uh, are the, the <clears throat> uh, essentially, radio frequency, high full or microwave, it generates thermal energy. And thermal energy essentially means the, it's a heat, and heat destroys tissues. And essentially, a uh, heat uh, kills tissues. For high food, this is, uh, aside from a mechanical effect, there's also hollow uh, hub, a bubble effect. It's also, and they also uh, can be used to destroy uh, target tissues. And the, the reason why heat uh, kills tissues is the cells it's actually worked out uh, in the last few years. And essentially, cells are composed of water, proteins, nuclear acids. And protein are the actual workhorse of the cells. And proteins in human cells are, uh, are sensitive to heat, and um, heat kills proteins. And interesting thing is actually the um, uh, in a cell that the uh, most uh, proteins are, are relatively insensitive to uh, heat. But these uh, proteins are actually non essential. Those uh, proteins actually um, play a very important functions vital to the cell uh, survival or death are those that are most sensitive to heat. So once there's a heat, uh, actually the cell will die. These, once these critical proteins are actually uh, are destroyed, then the cell will die. So the key to the success of the treatment uh, is the, um, <coughs> The lesion has to be generally composed of living cells, uh, or at the very least, most of it. So this is the implicit the principle behind these treatment modalities. So you can see that they, they, they may not work well when tissue is highly uh, vascularized. So because once there's lots of uh, blood vessels, but because blood is actually flowing, uh, it takes uh, heat away. So in, in, the, in, the, in the MR uh, uh, image, it's actually hyper intense. Uh, so in this case, that uh, it will be a, a problem because the, uh, you cannot generate enough heat uh, 
uh, to the target tissue. Or it has a very uh, decreased uh, uh, cellularity. Um, in other words, it's highly fibrotic. And the reason I think that's because the, if, you, if you do uh, basic science research, you can see it's very difficult to quantify collagen in tissues. Essentially, you have to boil the tissues uh, over 100 degrees or overnight in order to uh, uh, quantify how, may, how, how much collagen are there. So it's actually consistent with the clinical impression uh, that the uh, uterine fibroids respond well to thermal ablation treatment when lesions have high water content. Uh, <clears throat> actually, they had living cells, but do not respond well when lesions have low water content. Translation less living cells, but more extracellular uh, matrix products. So um, you can see that some of the, the, the examples are not suitable for uh, thermal ablations. There's also some other caveats, um, contraindications, and uh, it is you know, mostly due to uh, Charles Sharpon's group that they actually reported there's a close uh, link between focal adenomyosis and deep endometriosis. And that's because the, um, you can uh, ablate um, focal adenomyotic lesions, but you cannot uh, ablate a deep uh, endometriotic lesion, at, at least as of now. Uh, so people, the patients actually spent a lot of money, but in the end, they still complain of pain. So, so that's the, the, the thing that uh, it's not um, uh, very good. So and as we can see that the uh, adenomic lesions often coexist with the- uh, Sorry. Sorry, please uh, try to conclude in two minutes. Okay, okay. Okay, I'm, I'm looking ahead. I think that's, uh, it's, that's uh, maybe we, sh we should um, uh, do some more research. And also we have to be careful because a lot of the, these published studies using a microwave and also uh, radio frequency studies actually sponsored by uh, manufacturers. So we have to uh, be uh, aware that there be uh, uh, no bias there. And uh, so in, to include, uh, to conclude that I, th I think that the thermal ablation has some promises, but also has some challenges. And elastography uh, can be used to guide the choice, uh, uh, the best treatment modality, and can be a very nice uh, imaging uh, technique. Uh, in, the, in the end, I think more research is needed. So thank you. Thank you, Sangwei, for the uh, insightful uh, lecture. Dr. Abro, you want to take over? Yes, uh, uh, this is a great presentation, Sunway. Congratulations. Very, very nice. Very informative. And, uh, Thank you. So the, the idea now is to, to invite our last speaker, that is our friend Fumi, Fumi Taniguchi, okay. as associate Hi. professor, that is going to talk about an associate treatment decision for pain and abdominal, uh, abnormal uterine bleeding and endometriosis. Focus on medical treatment. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So, okay. Finally, uh, it's my turn. Uh, I'm Fumita Niguchi, uh, uh, Total University, Japan. Uh, I will talk in this seminar uh, instead of my boss, uh, Professor Tasuko Harada. Okay. Uh, as you know, the endometriosis has these characteristics, uh, pain, infertility, uh, sometimes rupture of infection of schist or curl, especially the incidence of obstetrical complication could be crucial. Today, I'm mainly talk about the current medical treatment for endometriosis. Uh, for the treatment of endometriosis causing pain and infertility, we have to decide medical, surgical, and infertility, including art therapy, uh, such as IVF ET, by considering the various factors, such as age, treatment, history, desire for child, ovarian reserve, recurrence and malignant change of the region. 
Uh, treatment should be personalized according to background of each patient. Uh, here is uh, the evidence in surgical or medical treatment. A uh, two RCT shows that uh, approximately 80% of patients got pain relief after surgical treatment. However, 20% of patients are refractory. A post-operative pain recurrence is very high. Uh, recurrence rate was 40% after one year. It's a, a, a Japan Society of OBGYN data. Fumi-san, yeah. Fumi Hi, hi. Uh, can you play your PowerPoint? It's not moving. Yes. It's moving. No, I, hmm? anyone see the PowerPoint? I only see the cover, the first page. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, so anyone see? Okay, now um, good. Yes. Now the fourth slide. Can you see the slide? Yes, yes. Now, okay. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, this is the fifth slide. Okay, uh, the practice committee of ASRM presented uh, this uh, policy. Uh, endless should be viewed as a chronic disease that requires a lifelong management pain with the goal of maximizing the use of medical treatment and avoiding repeated surgical procedures. And they also described the uh, conservative surgery without a result of recurrence, complicated even for the expert surgeon effective drugs that can be used over an extended period will be needed. So from now on, the I will present medical treatment for pain by OC, the progestin, genogest, uh, L-energy, IUS, labeled neurogesterol into our uterine system, and didologesterone. And this is a very cheap, uh, good progestin. Uh, this list shows the uh, drugs for endometriosis uh, in Japan. As the uh, existence agent, we can use GnRH agonist or C, progestin and Danadol. As the uh, developing agent, a GnRH antagonist, selective progesterone or estrogen receptor modulator, sperm and serum, uh, aromatase inhibitor, COX-2 inhibitor, anti-angiogenic factors and immune modulator are expected. Ideal medical treatment for endometriosis is considered as follows. Effective for pain, safe for long-term use, does not suppress ovulation, it can be used during pregnancy, reduce malignant transformation. This slide presents the adverse effects and administration period. In terms of OC, we anxious about liver dysfunction, penis thromboembolism, and digestive symptoms. Uh, frequent GnRH agonist administration occur postmenopausal symptoms or decrease bone mineral density. In case of progestin, especially DNOGEST, in several months from the beginning of administration, atypical uh, uterine bleeding sometimes occur. However, the amount of breeding would be not much. I want to show this study evaluating the efficacy of cyclic administration of esinineal estradiol dorospirenone, EE 20 microgram, DRSP 3 milligram. In 49 patients who suffered from endometriosis associated dysmenorrhea. And the maximum volume of the ovarian endometrial significantly decreased after three and six cycles of treatment. Next, uh, bus scores of dysmenorrhea pain were also reduced after one, three, and six cycles treatment. 
these data suggested that low dose cyclic DRS PE therapy is a promising treatment, not only to reduce the size of endometrial but also for this menorrhea. Uh, this slide shows the various regimens of OC treatment in Japan. As you know, the after cyclic treatment, and the patients have every 28 days menstrual cycle. In Japan, the continuous regimens, uh, flexible and uh, continuous regimens were covered by the health insurance. In terms of this treatment, a maximum of 120 days continuous treatment will be allowed. In case of three consecutive days of bleeding or spotting, after four days, drug-free interval is needed. In another continuous regimen, 77 days continuous treatment is done, irrespective of uterine bleeding. These continuous OC regimens would be quite effective to treat dysmenorrhea associated with endometriosis. This slide presents continuous versus cyclic OC treatment after surgery and recurrence of endometrioma. The risk ratio of recurrence in case of continuous OC is 0.54. Showing that the continuous OC treatment is associated with a reduced recurrence rate. And this slide shows the advantage of continuous OC treatment for reducing bus pain. 24 weeks treatment with continuous SNL estradiol dorospirenone decreased bus score. This slide show also exhibits the advantage of OC for reducing the size of ovarian endometrioma. 24 weeks treatment with continuous OC decreased the size of ovarian endometrioma compared with placebo. This slide summarizes the OC treatment. OC decreases in pain associated with endometriosis, and similar effects to GnRH agonist. Efficacy of continuous OC administration. OC reduces the size of ovarian endometrioma. However, the efficacy of peritoneal lesion, DE, and less common endometriosis is unclear. Postoperative OC treatment for ovarian endometrioma decreases the recurrence rate. A recurrence rate with OC 8% versus without OC 34%. Next, I will explain the oral good progestin, Genogest, that was sold in Japan from 10 years ago. The, uh, it is safe and effective for long term control of endometriosis associated pain. A major adverse effect are atypical genital bleeding and hypoestrogenic symptoms are infrequent. A decrease in bone uh, mineral density is marginal. Here, genogas can be used for adenomyosis, extragenital endometriosis, uh, such as bladder, colon, skin, and so on. And post-operative long term management. Uh, it's a, a direct inhibitory effect on HPO axis and endometriotic tissues and suppress ovarian function such as ovulation and estradiol production and suppress proliferation of endometriotic cells. Consequently, reducing pain and region size.
uh, this phase three study data showed uh, oral DNA guest had the equivalent efficacy to leuproride depot the standard dose in relieving the, uh, the pain associated with endometriosis. Uh, next, I want to explain the LNG IUS levonorgestrel releasing intelligence system. Uh, FDA approved to treat heavy menstrual period in women who do not wish to conceive. In Japan, the treatment for uh, hypermenorrhea and on dysmenorrhea was covered by health insurance. And it's very cheap. It delivers a small amount of progestin, 20 micrograms per day, locally into the uterus and lasts as long as you want or up to uh, five years. Uh, both uh, LNG IUS and GNH agonists were effective in the treatment of chronic pelvic pain associated endometriosis, although no difference was observed between the two treatments. This slide shows that uh, this menorrhea bath score uh, decreased over time after administration of uh, didolgesterone, uh, and the decrease was significant at and after the second cycle of administration. Uh, and then, uh, second cycle of menstruation, I'm sorry. Didolgesterone has been considered as an alternative because they are inexpensive and may have a better adverse profile than other choices. Very good uh, progesterone, this uh, digital progesterone. Uh, this slide shows uh, expecting developing agent. And chronic, uh, stud chronical studies for the oral GNH antagonist are partially finished on ongoing. Sperm or aromatase inhibitor are ongoing. In addition, uh, several immunomodulators and anti angiogenics are expected. Uh, this scheme shows the uh, management of endometriosis of patient with pain. First, as a medical treatment, NSAIDs, OC, GNGAST, GNH agonist, and LNG IUS are used. If the pain is not improved after this medical treatment, or if the patient have intolerable pain uh, more than uh, six to seven uh, centimeter large, large endometrioma, desire for spontaneous uh, natural pregnancy or abnormal findings in ultrasonography or MRI finding, such as the suspicion of uh, infection or ma malignant change. I mean, uh, the laparoscopic surgery could be recommended. After surgery, the, for the prevention of recurrence, additional medical treatment should be used. This drug also would be recommended in case of recurrence. Move on the uh, uh, next issue. Uh, oh no, sorry. Uh, could you read it? Uh, for, uh, I will talk about the effect of surgery briefly. It's a typical case of uh, endometrioma. Uh, first, the uh, adhesiolysis around left endometrioma was you know, performed. The content of cyst was spilled and removed and then, then the, opened the cyst wall and the cystectomy was performed. Uh, Dr. Kani said his surgical arrow uh, is the target of cystectomy. Last uh, check the potency of fallopian tubes. It's a typical case. Uh, here is the guideline of surgical treatment for endometriosis associated infertility by SRMA, JSOG, Japan Society. 
In almost cases, the surgical treatment is recommended. But the, for minimal or mild endometriosis, the benefit is small. On the other hand, surg surgery before IVF and secondary, second surgery for recurrence was not recommended for the issue of ovarian reserve. In fact, uh, we are uh, making the new guideline in Japan society OBGYN now. Uh, I summarize the pros and cons of surgical treatment of ovarian endometrium for infertile patients. In terms of surgery, uh, the advantage uh, treat tolerable pain prevent the risk of abscess, ruptured endometrium, uh, check tubal potency and adhesion, prevent risk of occurrence malignancy, egg retrieval difficulties uh, on IVFET on contamination of endometrium context, also low recurrence rate uh, can be in indicated. Uh, on the other hand, uh, expectant management can prevent uh, surgical related ovarian damage, surgical complication, uh, cardiovascular disorder due to ovarian dysfunction, and economic cost and time loss for surgery. In addition, the lack of evidence that surgical improve, surgery improves fertility and IVF pregnancy rate is a crucial point. And some Japanese investigators, uh, Dr. Iwase group, presented AMH level decreased after cystectomy for endometriomas and uh, cystectomy or bilateral endometrioma declined AMH level compared to unilateral endometrioma. We know bilateral cystectomy causes a noted uh, decline of postoperative pregnancy rate. And this slide shows the impact of cystectomy. As you know, the ovarian reserve could be diminished uh, by cystectomy of endometrioma. After cystectomy, the response of uh, gonadotropin stimulation for IVF patients is inadequate. A resection of a small endometrium in young patient may be associated with the risk of increased risk of causing of more significant injury to ovarian reserve. Existence of endometrioma themselves may decrease the ovarian reserve. So how should we decide the treatment expectant systemically or IVF for infertile patient with endometriosis? When we compared more than, more than or less 38 years, pregnancy rate was quite low. I proposed this uh, therapeutic strategy for infertile patients with endometrioma. Uh, in case of large cyst, intolerable pain, and not in recurrent region, surgery such as uh, cystectomy or ablation would be recommended. Uh, on the other hand, less than 38 years patient with normal uh, fallopian tube, the treatment would be proceeded step by step within 12 months. But with abnormal tube, occlusion, adhesion around tube, or more than 38 years, in case of uh, male factor, a treatment would be needed to get pregnant. And last, uh, I will summarize uh, the life stage and treatment of endometriosis. For pain control, NSA is uh, long-term OC. Progestin administration were useful. In adolescent and young adults, adults OC and progestin prevent the uh, occurrence of uh, propagation and surgery preserve in, uh, fertility and uh, after treatment by OC or progestin prevent from recurrence. For the infertility, infertile patient, surgery may promote spontaneous pregnancy. Prior to menopause, in case of severe symptom, radical surgery would be needed and progestin was uh, quite effective to escape into menopause. 
Uh, in conclusion, we can say uh, according to symptom region and life stage, uh, individualized treatment using the different characteristic profiles of drugs uh, may be most pro appropriate, pro appropriate uh, approach. Uh, reliable drugs in our hands, uh, or she uh, continuous and progesterone, additional agents that can be replaced and uh, used with progesterone or she are awaited. A future study will present new agent that uh, offer the possible uh, alternative yes. to currently available uh, therapies. That's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tanikoshi. Uh, thank you very much, our professors and uh, uh, speakers. There are many questions here, but uh, just I want to, uh, because we are in shortage of time, I want to select uh, some questions, uh, one question for each of the speakers. First of all, uh, there's a question for Professor Sintesai. Do you, do you think that uh, uh, some mar inflammatory markers such as CRP or ESR uh, can... I cannot hear you. Sorry, I can uh, hear you. Hmm? Please. Help us to diagnose the correlation between COVID-19 and endometriosis. Sorry, can you repeat Sorry? the question? Because I can you can't hear you. Uh, Anna, how do I just? I'm just so bad. Okay. Sin, can you hear me? Yes. No. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, there are many questions here, but uh, just I want to ask, uh, ask uh, each of you, uh, professor, uh, one question because we are in shortage of time. And uh, for you, Sin, uh, is uh, the question is that. Can inflammatory uh, markers such as CRP or ESR can help us in, di uh, in uh, diagnosing correlation between endometriosis or COVID-19? Okay, uh, I think uh, so far for uh, COVID-19, they have uh, major a lot of uh, uh, inflammatory cytokines and only IL-6 was found to uh, negative associate with this uh, severity. Uh, no, uh, IL-6 high, the more severe of the disease. Other inflammatory markers that have done so far has uh, no uh, significant uh, correlation with the severity of uh, COVID-19. And also the, uh, the CRP and ESR for endometriosis, uh, I think the, the studies are all uh, 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 depends on a different group and the uh, uh, predictive power is also low. So, so far as that, uh, Dr. Farish just said, there's no uh, good uh, biomarker for endometriosis. Uh, Said, can I, I make a short comment? Sorry? Uh, let, me, let me make a short comment. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sin. Uh, there's, there's a question for Moracio. Yes, yes, of course. Yes, so no, just, just to reinforce that according to, to my presentation, I, I completely agree with Sin about the interleukine 6. And even we found a correlation between interleukine 6 with endometriosis as well. Uh, if you tell me without making any study among these markers, inflammatory markers, the one that may be, uh, may be relevant for this is the amyloid A protein because it correlates more with, uh, with uh, the, the endometriosis compromise in the bowel. But for sure, it's my personal opinion. We didn't check uh, scientifically yet. Okay, thank you. Sai, back to you. Sai, back to you. Uh, can I ask the second question? <clears throat> yes. Yes, uh, uh, 
Moracio, there is a, a question about a comparison between uh, 2D ultrasound or, and 3D ultrasound for diagnosing uh, rectal endometriosis. Uh, can you inform us about the literature or your experience about this? Yes, uh, we, 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 had a, we made a study before about these two possibilities. And for endometriosis, we see no difference on, on between the two methods, right? We saw that it may improve a little bit for adenomyosis, but not for deep endometriosis compromising the bowel. Yes. Uh, there's, uh, if Sami can hear me, Sami? Sunway? Is not online? Yes, uh, yes, there's a question for you. Uh, is, is it, is it uh, mandatory to perform elastography for elastosonography for diagnosing uh, adenomyosis? Is there any uh, article in the literature which compared B mode uh, sonography or uh, traditional ultrasound with elastography? for diagnosing adenomyosis? Sanvi? Sanvi, can, he, can you hear me? Sanvi, can you hear uh, uh, Saiz's question? Maybe uh, Professor Abra can have no, a comment on that. Yes, I, I can. Uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to think with his mind, right? Because I know a lot of his studies, what I truly appreciate. But I think that uh, according to his studies, Sunway is very optimist about using the elastography for the diagnosis of adenomyosis. So it's really something to be considered, even us in Brazil, we are starting to use elastography for this purpose. So I, I, I think that his recommendation is to, is to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And if Sami is still present, can, can you uh, have a comment on this, Sami? It seems as he's not here. Uh, then, uh, another question for medical treatment uh, from Professor Taniguchi. Is he present or not? Okay. Hey. Yes, uh, for me, uh, how, how do you think about the antagonists and immunomodulators as a future of medical uh -huh. treatment of endometriosis? Antagonists uh -huh. and immunomodulators. Uh, in Japan, uh, it is, uh, we cannot use uh, now, but uh, I think that this uh, antagonist for uh, uterine myoma, myeloma, very good effect for the uh, one month or two months. So I think a very uh, good uh, uh, candidate for the individual uh, treatment, I think. But uh, uh, but now the uh, we Jap Japanese can cannot use this uh, this, this region. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, all speakers and professors. Uh, if uh, Professor Abra or Professor Tsai have any comment or uh, uh, any recommendation for me for tomorrow, uh, please let me know. Okay, thank, thank you so much. Yes. For yeah, organizing this section. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Saeed. Uh, it's a it was a pleasure to be with with you here, and uh, in this pandemic times. We are learning a lot how to be closer to our friends from all over the world. So mm -hmm. I know that this is a bad time for everybody, but uh, the legacy in terms of us to be together more frequently is very mm -hmm. nice. Thank you for, for inviting mm -hmm. us. Thank you very much. It, it seems that uh, Sami joining us. Uh, let me ask the question about the adenomyosis and uh, uh, regarding the uh, mandatory uh, elastosonography for diagnosing uh, adenomyosis or just B mode is enough, or is there any uh, comparison in the literature? 
Sambi? It, it seems that he cannot hear me. So uh, maybe uh, we will uh, close the, this session and tomorrow at the same time, just uh, sharp on 4 p.m. on Iranian time and uh, uh, this should be equal to your local time. We will start, we will start the second day of the webinar, which, is, uh, which includes uh, three debates and uh, we will see each other tomorrow. Thank you very much, indeed. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you. Say bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you.